Welcome to the 35th episode of Metaqua Talks. Today, we're speaking with Paul Brody, Global Blockchain Leader at ENY, based out of San Francisco. Paul is responsible for driving ENY's initiatives and investment in blockchain technology across consulting, audit, and tax business lines, including the build of ENY's first global SaaS platform, blockchain.ey.com. Tim at the helm, ENY was the first firm to commit to public blockchains, as, such as Ethereum. And since then, it has launched public blockchain solutions, including participating in the creation of the baseline protocol alongside Consensus and Microsoft, and has also helped build the industry's first smart contract testing platform and first on-chain audit platform, as well as being responsible for other industry-leading technologies, including the Nightfall and Starlight platforms. Paul, welcome to Metaco Talks. Thanks for having me. Okay, well, let, let's let's dive right in. Can we start with a little bit of your background? I mean, full-time E&Y blockchain lead since 2016. It's pretty early from an institutional perspective to, to, to make that bet. How did you get there? I got there actually because I went down this like blockchain rabbit hole all the way back, really kind of starting in 2013. I was working at IBM. I was the, the VP and the head of the global electronics industry. And we were starting to talk to clients about handling the complexity of large-scale IoT networks. And one of the things we realized, we had these aha moments like, hey, these smart devices that we're carrying around, they, they're idle most of the time. And the same chips that power smart devices are going in light bulbs and doorknobs and washing machines. And I had a client, um, actually Samsung, they said, you know, we, need a, we just need a fundamentally a cheaper way to run our large scale computing business for all these IoT networks. These devices are gonna be in service for years. It costs money. It's not a big deal when you have like a thousand dollar smartphone, but it starts to be a really big deal when you have say a billion $10 light bulbs mm. that are likely to last about 10 years. And so they were starting to think very strategically about the future. And so we started to think about distributed computing infrastructure where these devices would manage themselves. And we looked, and as you know, there, there's quite a lot of these different distributed computing infrastructures out there. We started to look at, at Bitcoin and a couple of other things, and we were kind of interested in Bitcoin. We used to sit around, we used to joke, we said, you know, the cool thing about crypto and blockchain systems is in some ways they're, they're very inefficient, but, you know, does it matter if they're inefficient because, you know, you've got all these devices, they're idle and... We would always joke with like, hey, I don't know what anyone's going to pay for with the Internet of Things, but it'll be really – somebody will figure it out. And when they do, they'll be so happy they have like payments and accounts. And about halfway through the project, sometime in 2014, one of my colleagues came to me and said, I've met this guy. He's a little strange, but I think you'd really like him. He wants to do like Bitcoin, but for computing. And I was like, well, this sounds really interesting. I want to meet him. And so I met Vitalik Buterin. In of fact, course. I met him. I met him a couple of times. And and funny thing was actually, uh, it was actually in Switzerland. It was at the he he came to the IBM lab, I think, in Zurich. Um, and we worked together a little bit. He worked with our team as well. It was um it was eye-opening and it was a lot of fun. And we switched over from thinking about Bitcoin to really focusing on Ethereum. And we built this mm. prototype platform for Samsung based on the alpha version of Ethereum. And then we added some oh. other features like messaging and, and, and BitTorrent. We integrated BitTorrent in there because we wanted large file transfer. And uh, we showed it off actually in January, in January of 2015 at CES. Um, so, so I went down that rabbit hole and I knew once I had really sort of understood it, I was like, this is transformational. This is transformational. This is, this is on a par with like the arrival of mobile data or ERP or supply chain planning. And... I knew at that point that was something I wanted to go really invest my time in. And uh, I left IBM in large part because IBM didn't want me to really focus on that. They wanted me much more focused on mobile. I wanted to do blockchain. And so I went to EY where they expressed a great interest in like mobile and IoT and blockchain. And EY was trying to become much more tech centric and tech driven. And it took me about a year after arriving at EY to convince our senior leadership that we shouldn't just do a little bit of blockchain stuff. We should take it very seriously, and it should be one of our foundational technology plays alongside AI and 5G. Fascinating journey, and particularly, I mean, the, moving from, from IBM, which now is fully embracing this space, to EY. Um, you know, as you said, you made you made some personal bets in the space and then obviously you've been driving some of those, those, let's say institutional bets in ENY. Are you able to give us a kind of a background of what those initiatives are and how are you in Y's position, the value chain, what kind of solutions offer? And particularly, how did you convince them about public chains, permission chains that was completely out of the ordinary 2016, 20 or 2017 rather a year later. Yeah. It's, 
It's um, so we we've been we've been sort of zeroed in on public change for a while. And here, I think some of my background as a bit of a history nerd and a technology nerd um, kind of and, and a strategy guy kind of had some some mm. roles to play. I've had I've had a lot of experience. I started my career at McKinsey. I spent a lot of time with IBM, which is is a tech company that's steeped in history. My my mother was a mainframe software developer. My father really? was a nuclear <laughs> physicist. So I have a lot of this sort of like tech history in my life. And I started to look at blockchains and I, I realized that, you know, I'm a big believer in this idea of like, okay, history repeats. It doesn't repeat exactly, but as they say, it rhymes. And we went through this before in the early days of the internet. People are like, wow, the internet's crazy. It's uh, chaotic. But in the end, open networks do tend to triumph over closed networks. There were several sort of key insights I had. Number one, open networks tend to, to, to triumph over closed networks because mm. people don't want to join somebody else's proprietary closed network. Very much. Secondly, network technologies are natural monopolies. One of these sort of standard articles of faith, you will hear people in the world of blockchain say, oh, we're going to live in a multi-chain world. No, we're not. We don't live in a multi-network world. TCP IP started out as a system to connect networks, but in the end, it ended up as the network, as the dominant network protocol. So uh, and network technologies are just fundamentally natural monopolies. So if you're going to have a natural monopoly, that means there's going to be just one winner. Historically, by the way, that single winner has tended to emerge within about a decade of the start of a platform ecosystem. So, you know, here we are, and we were there in like 2016, 2017, five or six years into the, the world of, of blockchain ecosystems, and Ethereum was absolutely dominant, right? And, yeah. and continues to be very dominant. And then finally, there was um, a bit of a the strategy consultant in me who said, okay, uh, do I want to be pretty good at 10 different systems or do I want to be the best at one? Right. And so sort of taking a page from that GE mentality, I said, OK, there's only going to be one probably big winner in the long run. It's going to be a public network. And uh, if we are going to, to play in this business, we should be the best at Ethereum, not pretty good at 10 different chains. And when I took that logic to our senior leadership, they were like, yeah, yeah, we can we can get behind that. I will not lie, however. It was brutal. I spent, I feel like, a lot of the last six or seven years often being the unpopular guy in the room saying, no, we're not doing it on Hyperledger. No, we're not doing mm -hmm. it on this. We're not doing it on that. We're not investing. And, and some of the companies that run these private blockchain ecosystems, they went to the trouble of tracking down the chairman of EY at home on the wow. weekend to complain about me. And I, I'm deeply honored by that. But at the end of the day... <laughs> I, and I'm so grateful to our senior leadership. They, their, their response always was, listen, we've made our play, right? We're doing something a little atypical for consulting firms to love to say that they're completely agnostic. We're not agnostic. We've called a play. We've built some solutions. And, and then lastly, very importantly, the last big play that we have is we looked at Ethereum. We said, what's missing? Everyone's trying to make Ethereum more scalable. But if you come from an enterprise software background, as I do, the first thing you look at when you see Ethereum is no privacy, right? It, mm. Privacy is foundational for enterprises. Individuals don't seem to care as much, but private enterprises must have it. And so we have been sort of really, really laser focused on one key contribution to the ecosystem as a whole, which is our privacy technology. So that's just a little bit of like the history and how we got there. Fascinating journey. And I, before diving into, I want to dive into privacy, but before we do, you mentioned something about typically kind of analogous. Look at other technologies; typically takes about ten years for for a, a network to dominate. When you think about that in our space, are you thinking Ethereum or it's a broader EVM uh, ecosystem? I'm thinking Ethereum, and and the reason I'm thinking Ethereum is, you know, EVM. When you hear people say EVM compatible, one of the things that I think a lot about is. Um, these compilers that used to exist, these cross-platform compilers that would exist for like uh, mobile applications. Mm -hmm. And what I what I observed, and 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 you heard really sort of top-notch people in the valley talk about this, which is cross-platform application tools produce mediocre applications, right? Because they're driven mm -hmm. to the lowest common denominator, they don't perform well. Right. And and indeed we have we've really seen that the top performance, if you go look at the mobile space, they 
they don't use cross-platform tools. They build natively on Android and they build natively on right. iOS. And I really think if you're going to make amazing applications, you've got to build natively in the stack. And by the way, EVM compatible isn't an absolutely perfect guarantee. If you want EVM compatible, you should really just be doing it on an Ethereum or an Ethereum layer too. Okay. Good explanation. I mean, let's go back, going back to that, uh, the privacy angle. And I recently listened to you, I think it was last month on Bankless, talk a lot about this. And, you know, you've, off, you've spoken about the biggest opportunity, the future and challenge is to have corporate data and processes permissionless on in permissionless and open blockchains, but in a way that's privacy first, just as you alluded to, um, and not attractive to bad actors, obviously. Can you kind of dive into that a bit more and expand on that? Yeah. So uh, enterprise transactions are really um, kind of, they, they drive, uh, all, if you think about how two companies interact with each other, it's almost always mm. that one buys something from the other, right? I would say like the entire world of business boils down to, I've got money, you've got stuff. And unlike financial markets where it's a swap, in enterprise markets, it's actually a money for stuff exchange under the terms of a business agreement. So I need to do a couple of things. First of all, I need to be very good at sort of articulating what the money is and what the stuff is. And tokenization is fantastic for that. And I will I do want to come back to tokenization in a bit because tokenization is is a is a step change in how enterprises can think about their money and their stuff. Mm -hmm. But then also uh Enterprises are very good internally using ERP. They're good at setting rules and process. Like, hey, we have a preferred shipping company. You're always going to buy from them. And then the ERP kind of enforces it. It makes it hard for you to pick from something else, right? With smart contracts, I could take that same like process consistency and operational consistency, and I could apply it across my business ecosystem. And I could do it in a way that's that's very consistent and operational. I can make sure, for example, if we negotiated a volume discount, I always get that discount because I can write it into the smart contract. Mm -hmm. But no enterprise wants to be able to do that in front of everybody else. If you think about it, there's two really important things. Number one, it, when you when you buy a device or when you when a, your comp a company launches a device, everybody, they tear it apart immediately and you know who's right. making the parts in it. Somebody's got to guess at how much it costs. So we know that not everything companies can do is secret, but it's very, very sensitive. How many widgets did you buy? Where are they now, right? What did you, what's your average price that you paid for them? Those are some of the most sensitive secrets in, in a business. And therefore, you've got to be able to execute these transfers, and you've got to be able to keep the rules of your business agreements really, really secret so that your competition cannot see them. So those were the, the, the key strategic goals. Mm -hmm. And then we had kind of a secondary goal. EY, we are, we're, like, we're, uh, we're like the Boy Scout of, of this space. Like We have to be cleaner than clean. And there's a part of me that wants – there's sort of a democratic part of me, a, a you know, small d democracy kind of favorite person who loves this idea of permissionlessness. Permissionlessness is so important. I really fundamentally believe, I have a phrase to say, there's no such thing as permissioned innovation. Doesn't exist. Permissionlessness is important, but at the same time, I do not want our systems that we've built, and we have built really great privacy systems, much, much better than just a mixer. We've built them to be uh, as permissionless as possible, but we don't want them to be attractive to bad actors. And this is something, mm -hmm. it probably pushed back with our whole launch by like three or four months as we thought about this. Where we ended up was taking a page from the internet. So on the internet, anybody can use the internet, but if you want to be reasonably trusted by other people, you need an SSL certificate. Every website has an mm -hmm. SSL certificate. And the beauty of SSL certificates and X.509 is they themselves are a public and permissionless open standard. Anybody can get them provided you can meet the requirements and you can get them. There's no there's no central controlling entity that's that's in charge of these. Instead, there are many companies that issue them and they all make the same efforts to follow the same procedure. So what we said was for Nightfall, which is our layer two privacy enabled Roll up that's running on Ethereum and the Polygon proof of stake network. Um, for for Nightfall, if you want to use it, you have to have an enterprise certificate from one of these entities. In this way, I believe we we met a requirement to remain fundamentally permissionless. But because you can't get that inform, you can't get one of those certificates without showing your enterprise information, without showing your individual identity, and having it screened against various sanctions lists. 
it's very unattractive to bad actors because you get privacy in your transactions, but you don't get anonymity. Interesting path where we're going then. Basically, I can imagine a lot of applications that you know company A, as you said, doesn't want company B seeing what they're doing. Then you can do this with confidence now in the kind of a public forum. Um, you know, when we look at this the space, it seems to us basically that the financial sector is kind of the first really thinking about adopting this at scale. Um, you know, what what sort of use cases do you see the banks looking at banks and FIs, and maybe give a little of, uh, maybe some context to the projects you looked at and. What problems are they solving, the incentives they have, and what are the challenges they're facing in this space? So there's an incredible range. We're having so many good conversations with financial institutions. And um, some of this stuff is like very basic. It's like, hey, how do I do DeFi with privacy, right? Right now, right. one of the things that that people don't, there's a lot of controversy. One of the things that a lot of people don't really love is the fact that a lot of the blockchain ecosystem, it's really easy to figure out who's doing what to whom, right? You know. Hmm. As an individual user, if if I use a wallet that's not linked to my ENS address, I can make a few transactions in a way that is largely anonymous. But if I'm a private equity investor, I'm a serious like family office, and I'm starting to buy million dollars of stuff, it's impossible to hide. People will track you down. You're creating too much of a trail. So some of this is just people want to have their proprietary trading strategies kept proprietary. So some yeah. of the stuff we're talking to is there's just clients who want to do this uh, that way. Second thing is non-fungible and low liquidity items. Again, people don't always want to disclose all the prices, but they want to have transactions. With Nightfall, you can do that, right? And so we're talking to quite a few startups that are trying to do low liquidity, things like that. Uh, anything related to an NFT, if you want privacy, you've got to do in like nightfall, like a mixer doesn't work with private mixers only work with like ERC twenties, right? And they also kind of make you a bit of a target uh, as well if you're seen using a mixer. So um, uh, uh, non fungible stuff in financial services, and then where we have a lot of interest is we're kind of a little bit unique in that we're still very interested in the industrial side of things. So manufacturing, supply chain traceability, inventory management. And a lot of the banks we're talking to have been trying to figure out how do we get in the business of financing assets, real world assets that are on chain. And we're just at the, at the cusp of a big growth in on chain assets, like real world assets. People are really starting to focus on how to build those out. And once those are out, if I'm tracking my inventory or my enterprise assets, why shouldn't I be able to borrow against them, loan them out, put them to use? So I think we're, uh, we're seeing quite a lot of interest there. It's a little bit slower than the pure financial stuff because we we not only need the privacy tools to mature, but we also need the real world connectivity to get a little bit better. And before diving into the bank, the bank issue, how do they, some of these, let's say, on chain um, analytics tools, how are they affected by these privacy privacy solutions? Can do you still have the same sort of uh, ability to track what's happening? You don't know. And and in fact, it's very funny. I was at East Denver last week. And if you walk around East Denver, you'll see there's a ton of these on-chain analytics companies. And yeah. I'm thinking to myself, you know, if privacy really takes hold, and I, I hope it will, it's going to completely transform their business. Because yeah. right now, almost all these on-chain analytics tools depend on the completely public nature of the data. Yeah. And that's going away. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously... We So we have a few bits and pieces that we're working on for the next version of Nightfall. So one is the ability to copy an auditor or a regulator on a transaction. So mm -hmm. you'd be able to copy your auditor on all your transactions and they would be able to, to mesh them in. So we're, we're looking for ways to improve the reporting process. One of the cool things about Nightfall is somebody can come to you and say, hey, I see that you're using Nightfall. That's the only thing you'd be able to figure out because you've got your SSL certificate. But what is cool is they could say, I see that you took you know, $300 million out of the Nightfall smart contract. What should you, uh, um, uh, how do we know where that came from? And you can submit your transactional data and with it, you can submit the proof of the truthfulness of your transactional data. So even though you won't be able to tell what everybody else is doing, you will be able to prove that your transactional data is truthful. Interesting. I mean, I, I, I think the interesting part of the start is well, having the, given the regulators effectively super goggles to see what happens if you want basically the transparency where it's required. 
where it's required, and I want to be very clear, there's no backdoors in Nightfall. There is no regulator that has the ability to see everything. Companies will have the choice as, over time to like do things like copy a regulator and auditor, right. but there, there's, no, there's no backdoor key. There's no magic key. There's nothing. Nobody should walk away from this thinking, oh, regulators can see everything. Not at all. Absolutely not at all. Regulators have lawful access through the companies that are doing it. And the, the one thing we're committed to is you will not be able to use Nightfall anonymously. Thanks for that context. I mean, you mentioned the banks being on the on the cusp. Where would you say banks are with internalizing all this knowledge about how enterprises will, will interact with blockchain? Where are they in the considerations of the tech operating model? And do you see the blockchain teams already formed with the majority of banks or is it still a case of just investing and learning, experimenting? Where, where are they in terms of actually the business looking to adopt this? So there's there's really a whole spectrum. But if you talk about the most sophisticated banks, every major hyper sophisticated bank has a blockchain team. It's a blockchain yeah. team that, that that's quite sophisticated. Um, there is clearly though there is a gap between at a lot of banks between the people at the very top and the people who are a bit closer to the cold face. And mm. what I mean by this is. At the very top of a lot of banks, you have a lot of senior executives who don't really fundamentally understand blockchain. All they kind of know is that like we can make cool new digital assets, we can sell some stuff to people, and there's like a ton of crooks in this business. And <laughs> when they look at it, they're like, they don't want to be associated with a crook. And this makes them sort of reflexively opposed to public blockchains and cryptocurrency, right? And one of the I, I met with a I've met with tons and tons of the people who are actually doing the implementations. And it, we get this really fun, funny sort of encouraging, discouraging message from them. They say, Paul, I'm so glad that you're talking about public blockchains. It's really important. The secret truth is that almost all of us here at XYZ Bank firmly believe that we need to be on public blockchains and it's almost certainly going to be Ethereum. And we're having trouble convincing our leadership. Our leadership wants to be in digital assets. They want to be on blockchains but they're still kind of reflexively opposed to Ethereum because it's a public blockchain. And we have to work them through that because private blockchains are just like IT projects. They're just like little IT projects. They're not real marketplaces and they'll never be meaningfully sustainable. It's an interesting comment. So let's take that to the end, the next stage, basically banks and DeFi. I mean, what are, what's the reflexive reaction there? Because it seems very much wild west, but we have banks like some of the largest global bank and some of the largest regional banks participating in Project Guardian, interacting with DeFi protocols like Aave. Um, you know, what are you, is it a defensive or offensive? How the banks look at that space? It's a defensive space. It's a defensive approach, right? So um, I've I've argued that DeFi is to banking what app stores were to wireless network companies, mm. right? They they take, they take provide this like, you know, you used to hear network companies and others talk about over the top, right? This mm. idea that consumers can access entertainment and video and things like that over the top of the cable TV system or the wireless uh, approved wireless network infrastructure. And, and DeFi in a sense does that as well. DeFi allows you to access like these niche applications Right. I built a perfect little lending protocol. I built a perfect little collateralization tool. I built a perfect little liquidity tool. Right. It's a little bit like uh, the way, you know, app stores work. Like there's, you know, you want a task management app. There's like a thousand of them in the app store and everybody's got the one that they think sort of works perfectly for them. Right. There's this kind of plethora of stuff. Banks are struggling with this question a little bit like cable TV companies and wireless companies are saying, okay, how do I want to deal with this? If I ignore it, my clients will start to go around me over time, mm. right? And and for sure, by the way, banks that ignore it will delay adoption, but they never stop it. And so there's others who are looking at this and saying, okay, is this an opportunity for me? Like, can I build a curation model? Can I be the gateway for access? Can I be the yeah. toll road? Right. And I think a little bit like some of the very successful cable and wireless companies, you know, the ones, the successful banks in the future are going to look at this and say, okay, our customers are going to want this. Right. We are going to pick, we're going to do two things. We're going to be the on off ramp, which is essential. And we're going to have like a curation model and we're going to make money on the traffic and the curation. And maybe we're going to offer one or two services of our own for where, where we are really exceptionally good at. So there's, I think those are the, the smart ones. They're looking ahead at that. They see that parallel and they're starting to think about it. But I think inherently 
it's starting from a defensive model, right? They're aware that there's this, this sort of insurgency. And one of the arguments that you sometimes hear from those who are, are bitterly opposed to DeFi is they say it's just regulatory arbitrage. And mm -hmm. there's some truth to that, by the way. Like DeFi protocols are cheaper in part because many of them have no regulatory structure. But of course. Yeah. I would argue the same way that ride sharing, you know, think about ride sharing. It was illegal like everywhere. Let's be honest. Like there were very few places where ride sharing was technically legal. It was almost always a violation of some kind of taxi lobbies, exclusivity yeah. program or medallion thing, whatever. Right. But at the end of the day, customers want it and it produced a vastly better experience. And what's interesting to see now is that where ride shares have been legalized and regulated, they're still immensely popular because they produce it, it their value proposition includes regulatory arbitrage but even when the regulatory arbitrage part goes away and they're fully regulated they're still a better user experience and i think um the advantage that these defi protocols have is that they have no history and baggage right so even when they come into compliance they can do it in a much more efficient totally modern way Banks have a huge advantage too. They know all about customers. They know all about regulation. Their major disadvantage is they've got a lot of legacy process and complexity that adds cost to their structure and they can't easily remove it, but they're not sure how much of it is really necessary. It's interesting. It aligns very much the way our vision of the market and what we hear back more and more from some of the largest banks that indeed there's a defensive element but there's a potential offensive element we think of a bank's main role is intermediating trust and they have this huge cost structure to do that basically and potentially move to an algorithm that operates 24 7 365 at zero marginal cost can they change that move that model from intermediation to a fee base? i think you, met, you said it exactly a fee-based model and they're the regulated bridge to this curated uh, ecosystem potentially right right and the curation part i think banks really underestimate how much value can be created from curation, right? If there's a thousand lending protocols, right. <laughs> offering the three or four that are top quality to your customers is worth money, right? Indeed, in many ways, kind of, if you look at search engines, um, one of the things that's super frustrated, like the, the best newspapers and others, is it that they've discovered that the search engines are better at making money off their content than they are because the search engines serve up the, this curated selection. Now, I would argue it seems like the curation process is being overwhelmed by the spam manufacturing process right now, but this, <laughs> the power of curation, I think it, 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 there's a, an additional advantage in finance, which is that when you go to, to, a wet, to a wet search engine and you're looking for an article or something, it's a low stakes activity. Right. But and, and you don't care so much about quality and you might be willing to live with the possibility that every now and again you get directed to one of these link farms. It's not like that with your money. Right. With your money, with your investments, your tolerance for risk and low quality is much lower and the value creation of curation becomes much higher. So I think um I think there's there's a much bigger opportunity here than banks than many banks realize in the curation portion. A lot of them are saying, "How are we going to offer all these DeFi services?" My answer would be, "You shouldn't try to. You should think about offering one or two that you are exceptionally good at and curating the rest." Yeah, we, we we've seen what happens when everyone's just chasing the highest yield in the market and on our own without any guidance. That uh, well, that's been an education the last year and a half. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about the banking space, what's happened there, and obviously there's a lot going on. I mean, where 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 are the Where's the corporate sector in this journey? You know, how far along are they, and and what are the use cases they're looking at? Which industries are moving? How are they approaching the whole space? So the corporate sector has been really slow, and and the main reason the corporate sector has been really slow is they went down this rabbit hole of uh, private blockchains, and mm. private blockchains don't work, and almost every single private blockchain system out there has basically collapsed or failed, right? And that and that. That was an expensive lesson. And I, I give you an example. You know, um, I, I talked to a company. They participated in one of these private blockchain consortia. And they're like, yeah, we tried blockchain. It doesn't work. No, you didn't try blockchain. It does work, <laughs> but you didn't really try it. And th that is a really tough thing because now in their minds, they tried blockchain. It didn't work. It was a fad. And it's going to be like three, four years before that company revisits the topic. The, and, and I understand why so many companies tried private blockchains, because if you look at what's doable on a public blockchain, the 
the the available set of use cases was very small. And this was super frustrating. Like you can do like some level of product traceability on a public chain, but that's it. Uh, now with privacy, we can unlock all these cases. So for the first time in like in, in quite a few years, we can go to clients and say inventory management, asset management, procurement. And so the, the priority over the next few years is to take these messages back to clients and systematically unlock more and more industrial use cases. Now, the way that we're going to go about that and the way that I, I foresee this industry developing is first, we're going to start with the things that are not overly complex. That means tracking items under privacy, moving them around and engaging in relatively simple business logic. We are very confident mm. that we can do those kinds of things with Nightfall and Starlight really well. We're gonna show, we, we have our first prototype customers for inventory management in the pharmaceutical industry, just one token per product, right? Easy stuff, right? And, and the beauty of that is that you can start to have the operational data. We'll have our second thing that we're gonna show in May at our global summit, is our first procurement system where I can have a business agreement with you. We can agree upon something like a rebate or a volume discount and the smart contract, which runs as a zero knowledge circuit, fully private on chain, will always automatically apply our agreed upon discount. So we can start to show simple logic like that. And over the next few years, we can ramp up the integration quality the, the volumes. So we know, for example, today, we think we can do about 260 million transactions a day on the Polygon proof of stake network. That's good. But by the way, just the automotive industry alone, if we wanted to bring them on board, we need 4 billion a day. Um, uh, the, some of the stuff that's in the near-term roadmap are things like EDI integration, EDI kind of moving people from this sort of legacy business to business messaging into like real supply chain coordination tokenization. Yeah. I said I would come back to tokenization. That is a revolution for how companies can manage their asset and product stuff. It, it creates a standardized model that we've never really had before. And then allows you to create a token and move it around the supply chain, imbue it with value, track carbon associated with it, buy it, sell it, borrow against it. It creates, it turns your enterprise data into kind of real assets that behave like tokens and are managed with like financial discipline. Fascinating. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, I, I've listened to your, your comments about the number of transactions before. I mean, this sounds like scalability is one of the near-term issues to really get the use case of these firms in, in place. I, I'm, I'm getting more and more comfortable. I said, I, we've tasked our R&D team with giving us a roadmap to 4 billion transactions a day. Um, we can see a path to 3.7 billion a day in the next couple of years. And I, I, I think it will take us a couple of years just to even get close to the 260 million a day we can do now. But I wanna have that roadmap. Because I, I, at the end of the day, when you're talking to an enterprise client, you need to tell them, we're building something that's gonna have a future. We have a confidence in the long-term roadmap. And, you know, we've got clients mm -hmm. that for a single product line need to generate a million NFTs a day. Yeah, I hear, I remember you making similar comments with the pharma industry it was just a huge number of discrete transactions per day. Is there a particular region or let's say country where you see more activity on the, on the corporate side where it's moving faster than others? Yeah, so uh, in the US, you see like the, so there's, there's these like very distinctive patterns. For the US, you'll see some very sophisticated, bigger companies starting to pilot stuff. Um, mm -hmm. In Europe, actually, the thing I've been really impressed with our European teams is they've had a lot of success selling a lot of smaller projects. Like uh, one that I'm really proud of is in Italy, we create a unique token for every article that's generated by Italy's biggest news agency, ANSA. Just very quietly over the last couple of years, we've generated a couple million tokens that prevent uh, the falsification of their articles. They, they're basically hashes and tokens attached to an article, and you can actually verify that the article you're looking at isn't been faked or spoofed. So, you know, the so Europeans are doing a lot of small singles. Americans, there's a few American companies are doing some really mega, mega deals. Uh, in the industrial space. And then finance is moving faster in Europe because of the um, the MICA law and the regulatory yeah. environment in Switzerland, both of which are giving people 
a bit more comfort that they can proceed faster than the less certain regulatory environment in the U.S. Yeah, we're seeing exactly the same thing. In the U.S. opacity it, it slows innovation, but in, at least they can innovate internally. But obviously, they need uh, a clear, clear view to, 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 the, to build the ecosystem. Right. The so good, what, the good news is, as I always remind our industrial clients, there's no regulatory kind of review required for you to tokenize your inventory. Like you don't have, exactly. you can just jump into yeah. that one. So, I mean, we're coming up on the on the end of the time here. What's what's next for ENY and what's next for um, Paul Brody? So my personal mission is to, is to really change how the entire world does business, to move everybody onto public blockchains. So what's next for us really is uh, a couple of things. Number one, we have to lead by example, right? So, so we're going to bring applications to market that use privacy and make it a standardized tool. Number two, we want to create an ecosystem. We want other people. Like one other thing everybody should know who's watching this is Nightfall and Starlight are public domain and open source. EY has relinquished all ownership over these assets. They are fully public systems and they are public systems because we want other people to use. So I want to create a, a thriving ecosystem. We are the, Nightfall is the only layer two privacy solution that has any form of sort of regulatory structure and compliance functionality. Right. And I want to see companies build on top of that. So for me, the job is heavily kind of entwined with the mission and I'm going to, I'm going to be here doing it until I feel like uh, I'm not adding enough value to move it forward, which could be a while. Well, <laughs> well it's been great having you here. I mean, I think uh it's hard to listen to you and not get excited about the space. So, you know, we will follow your work closely. Thanks for your time today. Really appreciate you being Thank here. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. To our guests, thanks for joining. And I uh, hope you enjoyed the episode. Until next time, don't forget, we'll upload the recording and script of today's episode at mataka.com. And as always, see you next time. Thanks for joining.